Hey, are you ready to stop working so much? If you feel like you're working 24 seven and your spouse, your partner, your kids are looking at you and saying, put that phone away, then you're gonna love this presentation from my mastermind, okay? Let's jump into it and I'm gonna help you put in place the steps to stop working so much. Stuff. Awesome. All right. So I'm a big believer in the separation of work life and home life, you know, like 1950s style where you went to work during the day and you came home and then that was it. There was no laptops, no phones, none of that stuff that you had to, to worry about, none of that stuff that can distract you. So we want to figure out how can we apply the same system that worked 50 years ago that allowed people to have two different lives so that you're able to have two different lives, even if both of those lives are in the same house or in the same container. So that's probably the biggest thing that I want to teach you today. Now, how are we going to do that? I want to tell you about Isabel Price. So Isabel came to me in 2008 or nine, the year after I did my first uh, business seminar. So my first business seminar, Vince Del Monte was there in the blue shirt. And that was 2007. And I made DVDs of the uh, event. And Isabel, Isabel used her fiance's credit card to buy the DVDs. So she had no money. She was a nutritionist in New Jersey. And she came to me. She was, she was just about to get married. They didn't have their kids yet, obviously. And she was an overworked nutritionist. And then she went and built this eight-figure nutrition business online. But she was then working at home and her, she had two sons. She's been homeschooling her sons since you know they were supposed to go to school. So she's been homeschooling for five years before COVID hit. So she's the expert in homeschooling. I've, inter, I've inter, interviewed her for my podcast. Anyways, so she would work right beside the kitchen in an office and then have to come out and go into being mom. And she really struggled with that. And so there was no that's none of that separation of work life and home life and that was where i really started diving deep into helping her with the brain dump you know by doing the brain dump and getting all the information out of your head and onto that piece of paper the ritual that we actually had her do and this is really great for anybody that works at an office or works at home is you do that brain dump at the end of the day you get all that stuff out of your head and then what she did was she went and she put that into a desk, desk drawer. And it was just the ritual and the symbolism of it allowed her to switch from being super CEO to super mom. And then I've had other clients, like my client, uh, Mike Westerdahl, he used to have to drive home from the gym and you know he would be still fired up from something that happened at the gym. And then he'd walk in and the kids would attack him. Like kids are under the age of six. Uh, at the time. And he wasn't in super dad mode yet. He was still in super CEO mode. And so we had him listen to a song on the way home that separated work life from home life. It had him switch, make that transition, kind of like Clark Kent going into the phone booth and, you know, switching from suit into Superman outfit. But it was the reverse from Superman outfit into the suit. And it was just rituals like that. And then the third one is we had Danny Lair use that. Danny Lair of Caffeine and Kilos, what he did is as soon as he walked into the house, he put the phone into the phone bed. And by putting the phone into the phone bed with his kids, you know, the, he walked in, kids were all over him. And it's like, hey, let's put daddy's phone into the phone bed. And then by doing that, it was able to help him mentally transition into being super focused with the kids. And he was super focused with the kids for like 20 or 30 minutes. And then they were like, they didn't want anything to do with them after about 20 or 30 minutes of dad time, which then they went off and played on their own. And he went back in, he could check his phone for about 20 minutes before dinner. And then he was focused with them again at dinner time and, and putting them to bed. So it's just that separation, even if the separation comes in pockets, like if you go and if you read Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, um, her husband unfortunately died in a really freak treadmill accident, like seriously, a treadmill accident. Um, and he was the CEO of SurveyMonkey. But when he was alive, Cheryl and her husband would go home at five o'clock. So she's a COO of Facebook. 
and she would go home at five o'clock and they would have dinner time until and kid time until about eight. And then she would go back to work from like eight until 11. Now it, it's, it's still working a little too much, obviously, but there was a separation. And so in those three hours, there was no work. And that's the thing that you need to do. You need to be able to put the phone away when it is time to do whatever it is that is outside of work. And that's the secret. That's the key. So we always want to build systems for these transitions. And when you can do that, then you stop feeling guilty about you're always working when you're at home or you're always thinking about it home when you're at work right or you're you're messaging errands and family stuff when you should be working and then you're messaging work when you should be with family and that's the mistake that you don't want to make anymore that's the stuff that you want to put in the past and so when you're able to do that you're you're able to make that transition and be free and have that mental space what we're trying to do here is open up space in your brain and open up space in your schedule so that you don't have two competing demands for the same uh, stuff on the calendar. That's what we're looking to do. And when you're able to do that by having those boundaries, then you're able to freely focus. So what do you want to do? You want to have physical boundaries. You want to have physical boundaries that can be like, here's the office in which you work. And when you are in that office, it's all work. There's no fun. Uh, it, it's a no fun zone. It's, um, it's separate from all other parts of the house. The kids don't go into the office. So, you know, maybe they can come and visit you at the end of the day and then you can, you can leave the office. But it is just having that physical boundary. And, and for me, what I aim to do is I aim to have the crappiest room in the house. One that I don't want to spend a lot of time in. Because if you have this really amazing office, then you want to go and hang out in it. And I don't want that. I want a dark, dingy room. Um, I want a different room for filming and stuff, obviously. But I want a dark office, small, desk, very Spartan, that forces me to focus on getting my work done so I get out of that room. That's the way that I look at it. Now you can look at it and you can say, I want to have a beautiful office. I like working in blah, blah, blah. Great. Just as long as it is physically separated. Now there's a couple of other things that you can do <clears throat> in addition to it. Sometimes the, like if you have to work at your kitchen table, the problem is that you're going to be interrupted, right? People don't know if you're working. They, maybe they think you're screwing around and watching a YouTube video. And so they interrupt you all the time. They're not respecting your boundaries. <clears throat> So I learned this idea from Jack Canfield and Jack Canfield, what he did is he had a hack. Jack Canfield's, you know, chicken soup for the soul, very famous guy. And he worked at home and there was other people in the house. But when Jack had a certain hat on, that meant you do not bother Jack. He's either thinking about work, he's in the middle of work, you do not interrupt him. And just by clearly communicating that, which is a verbal part of things, by clearly communicating when you are working, what signifies that you're working. Like for me, when my earphones are in, that generally signifies that I'm focused on doing something. If they're not in, great, you can talk to me. If they're in, well, I can't actually hear you anyways if you talk to me because I'm probably listening to something or I'm in a conversation with someone. And so therefore, the earphones are a great indication, a physical indication, a physical boundary. Even if I am in the kitchen, there are a physical boundary to work and home, even though I'm in, this, in the home space. So think about that. Now, the problem is if you don't clearly communicate that physical boundary, then people are not going to recognize it. They're going to overstep. And then that's when you're going to get frustrated. Can't you see I'm working? Well, no, I can't see you're working because you're just wearing a red hat and you have earphones in and you're at the kitchen table. How do I know you're working? Oh, I didn't clearly communicate. So here's the checklist. I'm working when I'm in this office or I am wearing this sweatshirt, you know, this work outfit or hat or whatever it is, or I have earphones in. If any of those three, and it's just those three, it's not 19 things you have to memorize, then I'm working. And that's the separation. 
provided there is good verbal communication. Now, that's dealing with external factors, other people. The other problems that you have are that when you're at home, you see home things that need to be done, whether it is cleaning, organizing, cooking, et cetera. And so you must mentally switch into work mode. So there's a famous copywriter named John Carlton. And what he did is he, I guess he got this from his dog. You ever see like a dog just kind of circles and then they finally sit down on their mat, right? And he thought, okay, well, I'm going to circle my desk three times. He wears the same sweatshirt. He puts the sweatshirt on. He circles his desk three times and then he sits down. And that tells his brain. It's an anchor. It's much like Tony Robbins getting pumped up with an anchor song before he goes on stage. But it is that separation that allows him to then go into being focused on work. And so by doing that, it's very simple. And it's almost like, well, that, that can't possibly work. Or that's ridiculous. That sounds so goofy. I don't care if it sounds goofy. All you need are these are these things, these tools that are boundaries, physical, mental, and verbal boundaries, and allows you to work anytime, anywhere. Because I spent so many years on the road, you can plop me into the busiest airport. I can sit down and I can be in full focus mode in like 30 seconds. I have, I have my backpack packed, exactly. Computers in here. This is where the chargers are. This is where my protein bar is. Here's where, where my water is. You can sit me down in any airport, in any airplane, in any restaurant, in any Starbucks, and I can be working in a minute because I have those routines and structures and systems built so that I, even though it's very inefficient, trust me, like traveling and working, even if you have great routines is incredibly inefficient and you're much better off to stay home. But if you, if you are forced into that, you should have an anchor that an anchor system. You know, once I pull out the earphones and put them in, I don't care if CNN's beside me and somebody's, you know, eating McDonald's right beside me and, and yakking on their cell phone. I'm dialed in. And it's because I have mental boundaries that just tell me when I'm on and when I'm off. So that's the first step that you want to do. And you want to communicate those boundaries so that people don't interrupt you. And the other thing is you need to flip it so that those are the work boundaries. And often we just think of here's the work boundaries, but then you need to have the flip side, which is when I'm not in the office, I don't have the phone. When I'm not in the office, I don't have the laptop. When I'm not in the office, I'm not thinking about work. When I'm not doing certain things, or maybe it's a certain time of day, only work is only allowed between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. or whatever it is for you. Because if those boundaries are not in place, the temporal boundaries, the time boundaries are not in place, then that work will bleed into that other part of your life. And so you need to have the flip side systems, just like you have kind of bumpers and boundaries around, this is when I'm working. You need to force yourself into, here's where I'm not working. And when I'm not working, I'm not allowed to think about it. I need to be fully present with the other people in my life. So you can sit down with your partner and with your kids and figure that out. What does it look like for me to be performing at a high level at not working? What does it look like for me to be the best dad, the best partner? What does it look like? Okay, here's the definition of success. Because a lot of people don't have a definition of success of being present. Oh, yeah, I'm, I just want to be present. Well, what does that exactly mean? What is being present? Being present, could, you could just be sitting there on the couch and thinking about work. But is that being present? No, it's not being present. You're not being present at all. You are just sitting on a couch and you're in la-la land. So that would not be quality time with somebody. So define success. Define what it looks like to be in family time. Define what it looks like to be successful at having dinner. I know it sounds stupid, but seriously, define what it looks like to be successful at that. That's the separation of work life and home life. So you got to have boundaries on both sides. You have those turn on rituals. Not only do they 
communicate to other people that you're working. And not only do they communicate to you that you're working, but they help you overcome procrastination. So again, as soon as these things go in, I can focus. And most of the time, I don't even have anything playing. They're just in there. And if, and when, I, and, um, you know, like if, I don't know if you ever went to like one of those wave pools when you were a kid, this is the best analogy that I can think of, or you went and like you were on roller coasters all day long, and then you go home and you lie in bed and you can feel, still feel yourself like in the wave pool or like on the roller coasters because your body's still getting used to it. Well, it's the same for me. Like when I'm sitting in front of a computer and I'm supposed to be working, if I don't have earphones in, I feel naked. It's weird, but they're just the rituals. Um, so think about what's where you are, are procrastinating. So when you are supposed to be in work mode, what can help you get into the work faster? Of course, the planning and preparation that you do the day before is absolutely essential. But what are the other rituals and routines that can turn you on, can turn you into a robot that immediately goes and takes action? And that's what you need to do. Now, in addition to that, you need to destroy all the distractions and everything to overcome procrastination. But that's the mindset. How can we build systems? Uh, there's a guy named Scott Adams. Scott Adams is the creator of Dilbert. So if you've ever seen a, a Dilbert cartoon, first of all, they're funny. But second of all, they, they're very timely and they make fun of all the things that workers struggle with. But Scott Adams has actually written a couple of great books. One is How to Fail at Everything and Still Be Super Successful. Another one is Loser Think. And I forget the other one that he has. But his greatest gift to you is the idea that you shouldn't set goals. You just need to build systems. Don't set goals. Just build systems. So, for example, if you set a goal of losing weight, what's better, setting a goal of losing weight or building systems in your life that force you to exercise, such as you live, you know, somebody lives 20 minutes from their office and they don't have a car and you don't have Uber on your phone, but you have a bicycle. Okay. If you've used those three things in your system, chances are that you're either going to walk to work or bike to work. You're not going to take Uber and you can't drive. So therefore you will burn more calories. That's a system that sets you up and that's actually more effective than you setting a goal. Accountability to your coaches is part of the system that forces you to be successful. Those are the things that you need. So think about the systems that turn you on in, in, into work mode, that turn you into a machine. And then think about the systems that help you shut off so that you separate the work and home life. The three systems I mentioned before that I was talking about in the intro is one, the brain dump. And then you expand that into the brain dump, the priority to-do list and the process planning. So, but with Isabel, we just started with the brain dump. And then the second thing is that anchor song. So when I listen to this song, it changes my emotions, changes my mood. So instead of me saying, my goal is to be really present tonight, Okay, well, if you just go from, you know, writing an article or recording a podcast, and then you immediately step into the kitchen where your kids are, is the goal actually going to work? Or is the system of listening to the anchor song, and that anchor song is the song that reminds you of the drive home from Six Flags when you took your kids there last summer, and it was the best day of their life? What's going to actually make you more present and be a better parent? saying, yeah, I'm going to be a great parent or listening to the song that puts you in the emotional state. And the answer is the system that puts you in the emotional state. So look to build systems. Don't just set goals. And then the third thing that we talked about is in the system is putting the phone in the phone bed. If you put the phone in the phone bed, first of all, the system breaks you from being on your phone. It circumvents the biggest problem that you have, one of the biggest problems that you have in your life. Okay, now that that system is circumvented, and I did that with my kids, it's a ritual that allows me to connect with my kids even more. So that's, the, that's all part of the system. Another thing is like, if you 
part of the system has to be the destruction of distractions. So if your goal is to lose weight, but your systems allow potato chips in the house and you love potato chips, what's going to win? The system or the goal? The system's going to win every time. The system is always going to win. And the system's going to keep you down, man. Man's going to get you with systems. So it's the same with, you know, if, if you're distracted at night and you can't get to bed on time because you have Netflix, you, you open up a bottle of wine and one glass leads to four and, you know, whatever else, you know, you're on your phone and you don't have the reverse alarm. If you have no systems for getting to bed on time, you're always going to go to bed late. You're always going to wake up late and you're not going to be productive in the morning and you're going to be disappointed. And it doesn't matter what goal you set. It's the system that you have to build. So we're looking at habit building and breaking. We need to break the cycles. What are the cycles that, you know, what, what's the first activity that gets us in a bad mood in the morning? Usually it's hitting snooze button or sleeping in too late. Then you're going to go into a, a negative emotion. And when you are in a negative emotion, you will have a greater chance of making another bad decision. Let's go back to the dieter, right? The dieter wakes up, and if they eat poorly at breakfast, now they're going to feel like, I'm a chump, I'm a loser, can't even do this, so I'm going to go to Burger King at lunchtime. And then now, because you know, you're going to put the physiological and psychological effects of eating poorly, and now you're just going to eat poorly again at dinner, and that cycle, you know, now you're going to wake up in the morning feeling crappy, which means you're going to go to like caffeine and sugar, and, and then you can't break that loop. You need to circumvent that. You need to circumvent vent that by either getting up on time and having a good breakfast or just chugging a whole bunch of water. Fasting is, like, is a great way to circumvent things. So you need to break cycles. So look, look at your personal situation. Where is the work life and home life blurred? Where, what's my big problem here? What cycle am I getting into? And how can I stick a fork in that cycle so that just, you know, you've ever seen like a, a kid biking? And then something gets stuck in the front wheel, right? And they flip. Well, that just circumvented the loop. And so, so they did a loop-de-loop. -loop. And so you need to think about what's your problem? What's your problem? Is it drinking every night? Great. Then you need to pour all the alcohol down the drain and switch your identity, which we'll talk about in a bit, to the type of person who doesn't drink during the week. You need to make those changes. Um, this is good. Okay, good. Yeah, this is actually from my new program, the Effortless Discipline Bootcamp program. So I just filmed this the other day. I figured I'd share it with you. So everybody gets in these loops, right? And you all, like, whenever you get in a loop, first of all, you have to recognize that you are in a loop. And then you have to figure out a way to get out of the loop. And it's difficult. It's almost impossible to figure out that you're in a loop and get out of the loop without the outside eyes of a coach, right? So Gavin, who's one of our coaches, you know, he's got his fitness business. He's got his personal, uh, you know, he coaches personal trainers to grow their business and he works in our business. And he, he can just see, and just like all of us, we can, also, we can always see the faults in other people. So whether you've got, you know, your partner, your kids, you can see where they get in a loop. And, and it's almost comical to watch somebody go through negative, destructive loops in their life. It's like, do you not realize what you're doing? And they might even realize it consciously, but, but subconsciously, they can't break the loop. So you got to figure out how can you stick a, a hockey stick into the front wheel of their loop bike and flip them out of it, um, not uh, figuratively, but metaphorically. So then what we need to do is we need to support the change, right? You need to support the change. You need to do better planning and preparation than ever before. Because if, if right now, like you are in that, I feel like I'm working 24 seven and I'm trying to break this loop. It's because you haven't done the planning and preparation well enough. You haven't done the planning and preparation well enough. Anybody who has tried to lose weight, when they finally lose weight, what's the one difference from this time versus all the other times? 
oh, well, they actually did their meal prep and they actually hired a personal trainer and they actually followed workout routines and they got accountability. They did all this planning and preparation at a level that was five times greater than before. When somebody finally quit smoking, it's because of all the lessons they learned about how the 12 times they tried to quit smoking before didn't work. So they plan and prepare better than ever before. And when you plan and prepare better than ever before, you build a better system and that supports the change. Now, the next th uh, problem that people often have is environmental friction. Environmental friction. And your environmental friction just needs a li little lubrication. One of the best examples of this one is the planning and preparation, right? So planning and preparation used to just be two phases, or for most people, it is two phases. One, they understand all the things that they want to do, which is, in, in my opinion, they have to get it out on paper, and we call that the brain dump. That's step one, phase one. So you do a brain dump, or you at least have a mental list in your head of all the things you want to do tomorrow. And then you pick one of them as the number one. So you make a to-do list. Maybe you make this physically as well, but your to-do list, you do your brain dump, you get 18 things out of your head. Now, from those 18 things, one of them has to be number one on the to-do list, priority to-do list. Okay, great. And then there's number two, and then there's number three. Most people get that far and then they stop. But the problem is, you know, so if I made that to-do list at five o'clock today, and then I went off and I was, you know, did my evening routine, and I got to bed on time. And even if I woke up on time and didn't hit snooze, there's still environmental friction in the morning of going into the activity. So here's, here's hopefully you guys can see my magic hands here. Um, the, Cause I'm going to, I'm going to give you like a magic hand demonstration. That's really going to get your brain understanding how to be successful and keep a habit going. So when you say you want to do something, at that moment in time, when you commit to doing something, the inertia is very low. And so, you know, you can see magic hand is going downhill, right? Magic hand. So you committed to losing weight and you've committed to losing weight today at this very moment. You have the greatest momentum and motivation. So you need to do something immediately. That's like our 24 hour victory in our 90 day planning. That's why I insist on it. I insist like when you do your 90 day planning today with Daniel, that 24, that 24 hour thing on my worksheets, Daniel, I actually need to change it to immediately. I need to have immediately 24 hours, 72 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours and seven days. I need to change it to an immediately because the immediate gives you the dopamine hit. Right. Whenever you do something right, you get a dopamine hit. Whenever you and whenever you check your phone, you get a dopamine hit. It's a bad dopamine hit. But whenever you do something right, you also get a dopamine hit. It's a good do dopamine hit. And you want to continue on doing things that give you a dopamine hit. So if you do something immediately, you're rolling a snowball down a hill, rolling a snowball down a hill. There's lubrication so that one good behavior begets another good behavior. You're in a good behavior cycle. You're in the virtuous cycle. Good behavior, positive emotion, positive emotion, good decision, good decision, good action, another positive emotion, and you just are in this feedback loop. That's the feedback loop you want to get caught in forever. <clears throat> the problem is that most people don't take this success path. They don't push the snowball down the hill that then gathers momentum and more weight and it keeps going and all of a sudden it's going faster and faster and faster. Most people don't do that. Instead, they wait. And then if you wait overnight and you have environmental friction, if you don't do your process planning, so you do your brain dump and your to-do list, but you don't do the little bit of process planning to give a little bit of lubrication, in the morning you wake up and now you're rolling the rock up the hill. Who was that? It's not Prometheus. That was Sisyphus. Is that Sisyphus in Greek, Greek um, mythology? I believe Sisyphus was, so Sisyphus was this guy, and I don't know why he was punished to do this by Zeus, but he had to roll a rock up a hill every day and he would roll it up. And at the end of the day, it would roll all the way back down. He'd have to roll it back up. Prometheus was the guy who's the eagles ate his liver every day. I don't want to be that guy. I'd rather be Sisyphus if I had to choose. But anyways, you don't want to be Sisyphus. You want to be 
um, you want to be rolling your snowball down the hill. But anyways, the longer you wait, the more uh, incline there is, right? So, so if I make a goal today, so I say, okay, Craig Valentine wants to lose, lose fat or gain muscle, and I don't go and do anything about it right now. If I don't go and buy the foods, if I don't go and do the first workout, if I don't go and recruit an accountability buddy, which would have given me the momentum, I wake up tomorrow and the incline is like this. And when the incline is like this, it is inertia, right? It's difficult to roll a rock up a hill. It's difficult to roll a rock even on flat ground to get it going. It's difficult. There's inertia. There's physical and mental inertia to starting a new activity. It's environmental friction. If I wait two days, the incline is greater. Three days, the incline is greater. Four days, it's practically like perpendicular. And so that's why if somebody's coming into your world, whether they're a lead, you know, if they're a lead coming in right now and you can get them on the phone, it's going to go, it's like pushing a snowball down a hill. If you wait a few days, all of a sudden the inertia to get them on the phone is greater, 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 the longer you wait. And so you need to make sure that you don't let the friction become so great that it breaks the system. Uh, here, here's a little fun little story. So um, Michelle and I just bought a car in Mexico, but we're waiting to get the license plates for it. And we wanted to go from Cancun down to Tulum yesterday. So we borrowed a, a pickup truck, a pickup truck from the guy whose house that we rent in Cancun. Now it's a manual transmission. There's a lot of manual transmissions still, like old school manual transmissions. Um, they still are very popular in Mexico. Uh, I guess they're cheaper to make. Um, maybe someone can confirm that. Michelle doesn't know how to drive standard, uh, but I, I had a Nissan Maxima for 12 years. I love that car. And it was a, it was a sport model with a manual transmission. So I'm telling Michelle about how to drive a standard all, all the way down and we were talking about well what happens if um you know like like when you leave it in first gear or second gear too long before you uh shift gears the transmission you know there's so much friction and so much heat there that it breaks the engine down right and it breaks the parts down and so if you don't have the lubrication in there you break the system just like when you have a manual transmission and you don't use it properly or any car part, you know, and it's not lubricated properly, it, it breaks down and it's just un, you know, it's un, uh, it's heat that really breaks things down. So Anne's got the Porsche, so we can go to Anne with, uh, with all of our automobile, um, <laughs> automobile analogies. But anyways, at the, at the end of the day, with all my rambling here, is that you want to build a system in which there is lubrication and not friction. You want to build a system where every single day, the hardest things in your life are still like rolling a snowball down a hill. Even the hardest things. You built a system. So I built a system. I'm a lazy, unmotivated person by nature. I want to, if you've ever seen my video, and I think I showed it briefly yesterday, the, um, the world's most undisciplined man. Like, I just want to eat chocolate cake and watch television. I really do. But I never do that uh, because I have systems that force me into doing the right thing. So, the, you know, system number one, public accountability. I get up at a certain time and I do this and I tell everybody and, and my brain won't like, even though there's not cameras on me all the time, my brain won't allow me to lie to people, lie to myself, lie to people. So it's like, hey, I get up at four o'clock in the morning and I go to work immediately on my number one priority. I tell everybody that, I wrote books about it, and I do that. Um, last night, you know, we're kind of on a holiday. So last night it was nine o'clock bedtime and, and slept till five-ish or something like that. But that is like once or twice a year. And so most of the time I'm up at four o'clock in the morning, I go right into work. Okay. So that system, every single day when I get up, I'm pushing the snowball down the hill. 
I never hit snooze. I don't even, I don't even use alarm, but I still get up before four o'clock. But most people, what they do is they hit snooze and then they have increased the incline and they've added more friction to the day. And then the snooze becomes sugar and caffeine and that increases the friction and then another bad decision and so on and so forth. So whatever you're doing, whether it's trying to separate work life and home life or whether it is trying to <clears throat> lose weight or whether it is trying to make more money or whether it's trying to get better at sales with Joe's help, where whatever it's tr you're trying to do, you need to just, sorry, I plugged my phone in and kicked me off there. Whatever it is you're trying to do, you need to make sure that there is no friction. And it's the same with your kids, right? Like if, if your kid is struggling to make friends, you want to make sure that there's no friction when you're putting them in into a situation where you want to make friends, right? So, so if you dress your kid like a dork and then you send them off to uh, soccer or swim lessons or whatever, and, and you, know, you dress them like a dork, well, now there's friction, right? It's harder for the dorky looking kid to make friends. They're going to tease them. That's what kids do. And um, I don't think kids will ever change, no matter how much uh, people rant and rave about bullying. It's just humans are weird like that. So don't give your kid friction if you want them to be successful. And same for yourself. Um, all right, next. What gets measured gets managed. So then, if you are on your phone a lot, check your screen time. So you go into screen time and you say, okay, I'm on my phone four hours and 38 minutes a week on Instagram. Some people might be on four hours and 38 minutes a day. Great. And so Matthew Benvy is the master of this. He actually did this for a while. He tracked his screen time and he was continuously getting less and less screen time each week. Okay, great. So now you have an objective measure of when you're working and when you're not working. If you say that every time you're, whenever you're on your phone, or whenever you're on certain stuff on your phone that you are working. You can do the same thing on your computer. You can use rescue time and you can see how much time you spend in your Gmail, right? Or you can track the number of emails that you send or whatever it is that takes a lot of time. You can track how much time you spend doing it and then aim to do less of it. And then you could also ask for subjective feedback from your partner and just say, hey, how, how present was I tonight or this week? How did I do? You can do a weekly review and then just test and track your, your measurements over time. So always look to figure out how can you actually put a number on what you're doing. And then I think this is the last point is everybody's familiar with the definition of insanity. The definition of insanity being doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And whether that was Einstein or somebody else came up with that quote, look at yourself and go, okay, Every single day, uh, I get in a little bit of a fight with my partner, and it's because they think I'm not present, but I think I am present, and I'm not going to change anything. I'm still going to have my phone by my side, and I'm still just going to walk out of my office and go into dinner time and you know, not do any of these things, but I'm gonna, you know, we're not going to have these fights anymore. Well, that's insane. That's insane. You're not changing anything. And so you're still going to get into trouble because you haven't done, made any effort to do anything. So that's insanity. Now, the definition of results is accountability. The definition of results is getting accountability. So you commit to making a change. You say, okay, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to get feedback from my spouse or partner. And I'm going to introduce one variable. It's always good to just, in thank you, baby. It's always good to just introduce one variable, like a green juice, and see, does that one variable lead to better results? Does that one variable lead to better results? If you try and introduce five things at one time, you never really know what works. Like scientific method, we want to make cause and effect. I introduce X variable. I put my phone away for 30 minutes. What kind, of, what kind of effect does that have? Okay, great. Or um, I put my phone in airplane mode by keeping my pocket. What kind of response does that have? 
So you're always looking for that cause and effect, but probably one of the most important things is getting accountability. As your coaches, Ron, Daniel, Gavin, Rusty, myself, like we have all overcome a lot. And so whatever situation you're dealing with, we probably dealt with and we fixed it ourselves. And so now we're bringing you the outside eyes. We're bringing you um, strategic plans, actual data. Uh, we now have helped, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. You know, Daniel alone has like 50 clients. So he's seeing this with 50 people on you know, a weekly basis. And we're bringing you the exact things that work, the shortcuts for success. So kick the insanity to the curb and increase the accountability. So this slide doesn't apply here, but um, the, except for the one-on-one -on -one coaching part. Okay, before I go to the next thing, is there any questions on that one? 